The sound of Sunday morning church bells is both a call to worship and a reminder of the earliest history and most ancient traditions of this city. St. Louis was founded two centuries ago by a company of Frenchmen from New Orleans who named it in honor of a saint of the Catholic Church and who established a Christian mission here to the Indians of the Illinois tribes. The Sunday morning mission bells of 1764, however, were by no means the first to be heard in these river valleys. More than half a century earlier, there had been a mission on the West River Bank a few miles south of Laclede's landing place. It was at the mouth of the Priest's River, the River de Pere. And continuously from the year 1699, there had been a mission church at Cahokia, directly across the river from what is now St. Louis. This mission, predating even New Orleans, is the oldest settlement along the entire course of the Mississippi. In the centuries that followed, St. Louis has become a great center of commerce and transportation. Its essential character, however, can only be understood in the light of its ancient and continuing religious heritage. The first school in St. Louis, the first college, the first university west of the Mississippi, the first schools of medicine and law. These have their origins in the religious rather than the commercial traditions of the city. During the great national period of westward expansion, St. Louis attracted people of many faiths, German, Catholics, Protestants, and Jews, Europeans who worshiped according to the Eastern Catholic rites, Irish, Italians, Poles, and Protestant emigrants from the Southern and Eastern United States. St. Louis is a city of many churches, and it is a city where religion has been an exceptionally dynamic force in shaping the pattern of intellectual and cultural growth. Today, as a partial report on the way in which this remarkable religious vitality continues to influence the intellectual and cultural growth of our city, we are visiting one of the newest, and in some respects, one of the most remarkable religious establishments in the St. Louis area. Near the intersection of U.S. Highway 40 with Mason Road in St. Louis County, it is the Priory of St. Mary and St. Louis, a Benedictine monastery. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Lee Cavanaugh, and on this Sunday, we are visiting a Benedictine monastery in St. Louis County. Here in a little while, we're going to see and hear a high mass with music sung by the Glee Club of Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Now, in presenting the music of the Georgetown Glee Club and in visiting this Benedictine monastery, we make note of the fact that this year, Georgetown University is celebrating its 175th anniversary coinciding with the 200th anniversary of the founding of our city of St. Louis. The very remarkable chapel of the Priory of St. Mary in St. Louis has been pictured and described in a great variety of national and international publications, and it has attracted the attention of architects throughout the world. But more remarkable than the architecture of this building is the existence here in West Central St. Louis County of a community of monks living and working by the ancient 6th century rule of St. Benedict. The monks here are English, but the monastery is, in a temporal sense at least, American. To be more accurate, it has been established here in order to serve the special need of the St. Louis community. Now here we're most happy to welcome Father Columba Carey Elwes, the prior of the Priory of St. Mary in St. Louis. Father, on a cool day, would you care to have a seat? Well, I'll try. <laughs> but I think most people who know about the Priory here on Mason Road in St. Louis County think that it is only, or at least primarily, a preparatory school for boys. Can you clarify that for us a little bit? 
Yes, Mr. Kapner, you're quite right that um, most monasteries in the history of monasticism have served the community uh, where they are located. But that isn't, uh, you know, the primary purpose of a monastery, which is to uh, establish a place where monks can praise God, study, particularly the Word of God, and then do some work. And that work might be uh, like what we are doing here, you see, uh, running a school. But Father, if you weren't, for example, operating a school, then you might have chosen some other work to do, some other kind of community service, is that right? Oh, yes. Uh, many monasteries in the past have um, run farms or gardens, and we have a little farm here. Oh. Yeah. But um, that is not the, the primary purpose, and... Um, well, you know, I even remember a, a, a monastery that um, brewed beer. Beer? <laughs> a very good beer, but I can assure everybody that we're not going to enter into that market. I'm sure some facets of St. Louis industry are happy to hear that. Father, yeah. how ancient is your order of St. Benedict? Well, St. Benedict was born in about the year 480, and he was a um, student in Rome at the time. And Rome and the Roman Empire was very decadent and the morals were pretty bad. So he fled from Rome and withdrew into a cave in a mountain east of Rome to become a hermit. Father, if I can interrupt you, well, what's the difference between a hermit and a monk? Well, Mr. Kavanagh, a hermit is a person who seeks God alone. He is um, a solitary and keeps silence, whereas Monks tend to uh, live together to help one another. And in the case of St. Benedict, a number of disciples gathered round near the cave and asked to uh, uh, follow him and his example and his teaching. And then the, um, the third stage was when St. Benedict wrote his little rule, the rule for monks, and there it is. And that's the rule that we live by. Right here in 20th century St. Louis County, Father, huh? That's right, yes. Monks are not museum pieces. <laughs> well, Father, in a very short time, we have to bridge a great many centuries, but what in its broadest outline has been the story of your order since the time of St. Benedict? Well, I thought you were going to ask a question like that. How can I answer you that one? <laughs> well, for the first 400 years, anyway, the, the monks evangelized Europe. The barbarians were mostly converted by the Benedictines, and in the case of the Saxons in, in England, they are, the monks established monasteries everywhere. And one of the most famous is uh, Westminster, which uh, was founded just outside London, rather as we are founded outside St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And uh, London grew round Westminster so that uh, Westminster became really part of the fabric of the history of London. And I expect we will gradually be surrounded by St. Louis. Seems that's the tendency, Father. Yeah. Uh, going back a little bit, though, in ancient times, where did the uh, monks come from? Well, they came from the laity round about. I mean, the, the monks of Westminster would have come from London. And uh, we already have six young St. Louisans who are training to be monks, and one from Chicago. Well, you mentioned Westminster. This is the famous Westminster Abbey. Famous Westminster Abbey. That's not still a, a Benedictine uh, monastery, is it? No, I'm afraid not. Um, Henry VIII and Elizabeth I have changed all that. I see. Yes. And for about 200 years, the Englishmen wanting to become monks had to escape to France or other parts. And, um, well, the, they were received back into England round about the year 1800. Mm. Father, you obviously are, are English. How is it that you and the other uh, monks of the Priory uh, decided to establish a new Benedictine monastery in St. Louis? Well, I suppose it's true. We are part of the English export, <laughs> true enough. <laughs> but uh, to be serious, it was uh, started really by a group of very distinguished St. Louisans with the blessing of the Archbishop, uh, Joseph Ritter, about eight years ago, and they went to Ampleforth, four of them, 
uh, to see the abbot there in the community to ask whether we would uh, found a school and monastery over here. And the abbot and his monks agreed, and so here we are. Well, we're very <laughs> happy to, yeah. that that is true, Father. A few past questions about the school itself. Uh, how big is it? Where do your pupils come from? Is it in any way a special kind of school? Well, we have about 180 boys from the 7th grade through the 12th. And uh, our aim is to have as high a standard, an intellectual standard, as we can get. We don't uh, expect to have geniuses among the boys, but we want to have a good average uh, intelligence and above. And we work them pretty hard, but I don't think they mind all that amount. They start French and mathematics and Latin in the 7th grade. Seventh grade. Yeah. And they, um, the time schedule is pretty stiff. I mean, they arrive here at 8.35 and they don't leave until 5. And then they have two and a half hours homework, approximately. But uh, all in all, I think it's uh, pretty varied. And uh, we encourage uh, things like um, dramatics and music, uh, mechanical drawing and so on. And uh, we have lecturers in, like uh, Arnold Toynbee, who is great favorite. Oh, he's an old friend of yours, too, isn't he, Father? He is, yes. By the way, I know in just a moment or two we'll be going inside the Priory Chapel to see and hear the Mass, but I wonder, while we're still outside the chapel here, if you'd tell us about its architectural design. Frank, what we've come to think of as the traditional look in a church, and to me, and perhaps to many of our viewers, it's surprising to uh, well, in fact, uh, considering the much, the great amount of tradition associated with the Benedictines themselves, well, I suppose, in a sense, you're right, that uh, it's not what you expect, anyway. That's right, Father. But um, tradition, you know, is not just sticking to the letter of the law, to the letter of the idea. I mean, even in theology, uh, tradition is transposing the idea into um, a modern language, into the idiom of the day. And so with architecture, the traditional church architecture, it's not just repeating over and over again, but uh, having the idea and putting it in the material and in the method and uh, ingenuity of your own day. So when we were choosing an architect, um, we hunted around for somebody who had courage, I suppose, first of all. Of course, he had to have technique and imagination and sensitiveness. Finally, we came to choose the architects of that splendid um, airport terminal you, we've got here. Oh, yeah. Helmuth, Obasha, and Casper. Mm -hmm. Now, you were asking about the design. Well, you see that it's in three tiers, kind of fountains rising of thin shell concrete arches, each of them parabolas, a parabola. And the, the bottom two tiers, or fountains, are 20 uh, arches each. But the upper one, the top one, is only 10 very steep arches, and it serves as a bell tower and also as a lantern at night. Father, I'm curious about one thing. Well, what is this material that screens off the arches themselves? Very interesting. It's fiberglass uh, in double thickness, or, uh, strengthened in some way, and that gives us insulation. Now, you notice it's pretty black, isn't it, on the outside? But on the inside, it gives you a beautiful, soft, kind of alabaster light, rather like those um, ancient alabaster windows in the Roman churches. Oh, yes, Father. Mm. Well, Father, we've been talking about the inside, and the temperature just persuaded let's me that we might go in and take a look. <laughs> Surely. <laughs> All right, let's do that right now. Yeah. You see, the circular church has considerable advantages. You have the people all round, very, very near the altar. Nobody's far away. And then the communion rail is approachable from all over the place. Yes, Father. And then uh, the, acoust the acoustics of this particular church are quite lovely, aren't they? Yes, very fine. Yeah. Well, Father, I think the people will be coming in for the Mass in just a few yeah. minutes. I want to thank you so much for being such a, a gracious host and answering yeah. our questions here in our visit to this unique Benedictine community and school in 
St. Louis County. Very nice. Thank Good. you, Father. Thank you. Good. Goodbye. Goodbye, Father. The Boys Glee Club of Georgetown University is one of the oldest and most celebrated choral societies in America. It is currently on tour and today under the direction of Mr. Paul Chandler Hume, who is the nationally known music critic of the Washington Post, it will sing a special selection of music associated with the high mass of the Holy Spirit to be celebrated in this St. Louis Priory Chapel. The priest who will offer the Mass is the very Reverend Edward B. Bunn, who is president of Georgetown University. Georgetown University itself is, of course, in Washington, D.C. It is the oldest Catholic university in America, and this year it is celebrating its 175th anniversary. The founder of the university, originally called Georgetown College, was the first Catholic bishop in the United States, the Most Reverend John Carroll of the Society of Jesus, the first bishop and archbishop of Baltimore. Bishop Carroll arranged for the purchase of land overlooking the Potomac River, where construction of Georgetown University's first building was begun in 1789. This was the year of the ratification of the Constitution of the United States. Georgetown College became Georgetown University by act of the Congress of the United States in 1815. And in 1833, Pope Gregory XVI granted the university a papal charter. Now, here to provide a special commentary on the Mass is one of the monks of the Benedictine Priory of St. Mary in St. Louis, Father T. Leonard Jackson, OSB, who is second master of the Priory School. Those who are to perform this act of worship on behalf of the people make their way in procession to the sanctuary, headed by one of the priory monks carrying the cross. In front of him, the Theorofa, on each side of him, two acolytes. Behind them, the monks of the community of the priory, And behind them, again, the master of ceremonies, Father Paul Kidner. The master of ceremonies, Father Paul Kidner. The subdeacon, Father Nicholas Walford. The deacon, Father Timothy Horner, headmaster of the school and that the priest who is to celebrate the Mass, the very Reverend Father Edward Bunn, President of Georgetown. During this Mass, which will be a votive Mass of the Holy Spirit by special permission of His Eminence the Cardinal, the people will do three things. They will listen to the Word of God, they will offer themselves and Christ the Father, and they will receive from the hand of the priest the gift of Christ himself.
Any man who is a priest is always vividly aware of two thoughts. The one, joy and elation that he has been chosen by God for his high office. The other, a deep sense of his unworthiness to discharge that office. <coughs> Both of these thoughts are expressed in the preparation for the liturgy of the word <coughs> known as the prayers at the foot of the altar. First, the joy of the 42nd Psalm, to God who gives joy to my youthful spirit. And next, bowing low, the self-abasement of the confidio. I confess, I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed. And now the ninefold plea for mercy of the Kyrie Eleison, Lord have mercy on us, now being sung by the choir from a mass in honor of St. Joseph. crucifix, the altar of sacrifice, and the priest himself are now reverenced with incense. The preliminaries are over. Now the priest solemnly intones a hymn of praise, Gloria in excelsis Dei, Glory to God on high. Gloria in excelsis Deo. After greeting the people, the Lord be with you. The priest now chants the solemn prayer of the day in the name of all present. O oh God, who on this day did teach the faithful by sending the light of the Holy Spirit into their hearts, grant that by the gift of that Spirit, right judgment may be ours, and we may ever find joy in his comfort. The liturgy of the Word continues with scriptural instruction. Priest and people sit while the subdeacon reads to them the epistle, the words of the Apostle. Hearing that Samaria had received the word of God, sent Peter and John to visit them. So these two came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, who had not as yet come down on any of them. They had received nothing so far except baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then the apostles began to lay their hands on them, 
and the Holy Spirit was given. <laughs> We have listened to the word of the Apostle. Now, preparations are made for the proclamation of the word of Christ himself, the Gospel. Meanwhile, the choir sings the gradual, and after that, on their knees, the tract, begging the Holy Spirit to come and renew our spirit. The deacon places the book of the Gospels on the altar and on his knees begs the divine assistance so that he may worthily and competently give forth his message. Now the deacon asks God's blessing. Now he comes up to the altar, picks up the book, and asks the priest's blessing, so that, like the prophet Isaiah, his lips may be purified for their task. The book of the Gospels is now carried in procession to its appointed place, and all rise to their feet to attend to the words of Christ. Dominus Perpisco Sequentia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Iovanem In ille tempore dixit Jesus discipulis At that time Jesus said to his disciples If a man has any love for me <coughs> he will be true to my word and then he will will my father's love and we will both come to him and make our continual abode with him. Whereas the man who has no love for me lets my sayings pass him by. And this word, which you have been hearing from me, comes not from me, but from my Father who sent me. So much converse I have held with you still at your side. He who is to befriend you, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send on my account, will in his turn make everything plain and recall to your minds everything I have said to you. Peace is my bequest to you, and the peace which I give you is mine to give. <clears throat> I do not give peace as the world gives it. 
Do not let your heart be distressed or play the coward. You have heard me say that I'm going away and coming back to you. If you really loved me, you would be glad to hear <clears throat> that I am on my way to my father. My father has greater power than I. I have told you of this before it happens, so that when it happens, you may learn to believe. I have no longer much time for conversation with you. One is coming who has power over the world, but no hold over me. No, but the world must be convinced that I love the Father, and act only as the Father has commanded me to act. Benedict in Princeps Mundi, who you said in men on habit with God. Said O Cognoscat Mundus, we are diliger patrem. Et si good mandatum dedit mihi pater, seek patrius. Before returning to the altar, <clears throat> the deacon once again reverences the priest with incense. We have heard the word. I
And now the act of sacrifice begins. In olden days, the people would come to the altar at this point in procession, bearing their gifts while the choir sang an antiphon. Now the custom of processing has vanished, but the antiphon remains. Followed today by the 15th century hymn in Italian, O Maria Diana Stella, which will be sung for us by the V Club. The people no longer come to the altar with their gifts, but as the priest opens the sacrificial act by offering the host to God for our countless sins, offenses and neglects, we can and should offer ourselves, our plans and our projects and put their outcome into the hands of God. This is the essence of sacrifice. The custom of mixing a little water with the wine that is put in the chalice is a very ancient one, going back certainly as far as the Last Supper and probably further back than that. Father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. As the priest offers the chalice, we can offer our disappointments and difficulties so that they will draw us closer to God in love and not separate us from Him in bitterness. smoke rising above the altar should not only remind us of the smoke rising above the altar of burnt offering at the temple in Jerusalem, but it can also represent our prayers rising before the throne of God. Once again, the altar is incensed. It is incensed because it represents not only, not only is the altar of sacrifice, but it represents too the body of Christ and is therefore worthy of reverence with incense. Next, the deacon offers incense to the celebrant. The subdeacon in his turn will offer incense to the people. They are all sacred in the body of Christ. This washing of hands, formerly a necessity, is now largely a symbol, but a symbol that can remind us to purify our motives and warn of the danger of self-service masquerading as service of God. around. 
can't be proud. Yes. And now comes the preface or introduction to the canon of the Mass. This is a soaring hymn of praise and thanksgiving to God for, in this well, case, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Writing it is and just and proper and for our welfare that we should always and everywhere give thanks to thee, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, Eternal God, through Christ our Lord, who ascended above all the heavens and taking his seat at the right hand sent down the Holy Spirit as he had promised upon his adopted children. Therefore it is that the whole round world exults with overflowing joy the heavenly virtues likewise, and the angelic powers, together chant an endless hymn of praise to thee. <laughs> Et filios adoptionis affudit, qua propter profusis gaudius, totus in orbe terrarum mundus exultes. Sedet superne virtutes, atque angelice, Altes cahates, him nom gloriae, to a consinum, sine, sine, decentes. Sancti, sancti, sancti. The ringing of the bell indicates the awesome praise of the angels who can see God. Sanctus, sanctus, sanctus. Holy, holy, holy repeated by the choir. Uh, this melody by the Kyrie is from the Mass in honor of St. Joseph by Flor Peters. This is the time when we at Priory remember our fellow St. Louisans, our parents and relatives back home, our brethren at Ampleforth. This is the time too when we remember our many friends and benefactors in this country, when we also remember those who have been placed in our care for their education and upbringing. Remember, O oh Lord, thy servants. with a gesture of reaching straight back to the scapegoat of the Old Testament, the priest asks God to accept our offerings, uh, and by implication ourselves, as a peace offering. Order our days in peace, O Lord, and number us in the flock to thine elect.
And he, from the day before he suffered, took bread into his holy hands and lifting up his eyes to God, gave thanks and blessed it, saying, Take, all of you, and eat. And similarly with the chalice. The great moment of the consecration is past. Christ, in his body and blood, lies present on the altar in our midst. The scene and words we have just witnessed take us straight back to the Last Supper and the willingness, nay the anxiety, of Christ to accomplish his mission of redemption. And yet, the body that lies before us upon this altar is the glorified body of Christ as it actually exists today in heaven, wearing his wounds as a soldier wears his medals in triumphant intercession before us, before his father. And here, upon this altar, his intercession continues, and we, gathered round this altar, can make his intercession our own. He puts himself, as it were, into our hands, to be used as we wish. Adoration, thanksgiving, intercession. We speak now to the Father, not with our own feeble voices, but with the triumphant voice of Christ. This is the essence of the Mass. fellow members of Christ's mystical body who have passed through the gateway to eternal life that we call death but have not yet achieved the happiness of heaven. Next, we remember ourselves, sinners that we are, and beg that we too, in due time, may enjoy the fellowship of the saints, John, Stephen, Barnabas, Ignatius, Peter, Felicity, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, and the rest. And now, to emphasize Christ's role as our mediator with the Father, the priest makes the sign of the cross with the host over the chalice, and then elevates them both. Through him, with him, and in him, 
is to be God of the Father Almighty, in unity with the Holy Spirit, glory forever and ever. Amen. We have offered ourselves with Christ to the Father. Now, let us pray with Christ to the Father. Pater Noster, our Father. At divina institutione formati, al de musti tere. Pater Noster, we as in celis, sanctificator, no man to whom, ad veniat regnum tuum, the voluntas tua, secret in celo, et in terra. Amen, Nostrum, quotidianum, da nobis hodie, et emiti nobis, debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus, debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem. The sacrificial part of the Mass is over. What follows now is a preparation for communion. We pray first that we may be delivered from evil. The priest now breaks the host and places a small piece of it in the chalice. This is a relic of former times when the bishop of the city would break up a host and send a piece of it to each church in the city to be used in its mass, thus emphasizing the unity of the church. The Agnes Day sung by the choir is again for the mass in honor of St. Joseph by Flor Peters. At the altar, the priest prays for peace, and before he receives communion, embraces the deacon in the kiss of peace. greeting on to the subdeacon, and the subdeacon passes it on to all the clergy and the monks. If thou art bringing thy gift before the altar, and rememberest that thy brother has complaint against thee, leave thy gift lying there before the altar, be reconciled to thy brother, and then coming thou shalt offer thy gift. And now, after his own communion, 
and before giving communion to the people, the priest shows forth the host to the people as the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God, followed by the famous prayer of the centurion, Domine, non dignus. Lord, I am not worthy. But in just the second minute, it's time for the prayer books, and I'll be proud of the While the people receive communion, the monks sing the communion antiphon, commemorating the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles. After this, the choir will sing the hymn, Adora Te Devote. Each of these people coming up to the altar rails is different. Each of them is an individual. They have come from different starting points and origins. They have arrived by various ways. <coughs> they even walk differently. But now, as they converge on these circular altar rails from all the points of the compass, they come with unity of purpose. This is the essence of Christian unity and Christian charity. Ladies and gentlemen, this special broadcast of a high mass of the Holy Spirit has come to you from the chapel of the Priory of St. Mary and St. Louis in West Central St. Louis County. Music of the Mass was sung by the 55 Voice Glee Club of Georgetown University under the direction of Paul Chandler Hume. Celebrant of the Mass was the president of Georgetown University, the very Reverend Edward B. Bunn, S.J. The Priory of St. Mary and St. Louis, as we said earlier in this broadcast, is a Benedictine monastery. It was founded in 1955 by monks who came from the Benedictine community at Ampleforth in England, but it is in the process of becoming, and it will increasingly be, a community of American monks as its future members are drawn from the lay society of the American Midwest and particularly from the St. Louis area. This too is in the worldwide tradition of Benedictine communities which through the centuries have become a living part of the culture and history of the cities and towns near which they were established. A description of the Priory School, together with some historical notes about the Benedictine Order and about this chapel of the Priory of St. Mary in St. Louis, was given at the beginning of our program by Father Columba Carey Elwes, OSB, Prior of the Community. Commentary on the Mass was given by Father T. Leonard Jackson, OSB, Second Master of the Priory School. Lee Cavanaugh saying thank you and good evening.